Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Everything that moves, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week. And we've got an interesting game to break down as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade continues. I'm Fran Duffy. And as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 360. At the top of today's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with Greg Cosell from NFL Films as we take a look at this loss to the Kansas City Chiefs. And I call it interesting because I do think there's plenty of good to take away from this performance. But we'll look at this game from all angles with Greg before looking ahead to Sunday's matchup against the Carolina Panthers. A couple of things I want to make sure we hit on. Number one, As always, make sure you go on and leave us a rating, leave us a review. If you've got a question, jump on to Apple Podcasts, find our page, leave us a a question in the comment box. We will answer it here each and every show, and it's the best way to throw us your support. I appreciate everybody that takes the time to go on, leave us a review, leave us a rating. Really, really helps us in the grand scheme of things in helping uh, to expand this podcast. As always, too, make sure you go check out some of our other All-22 analysis. My All-22 review, that should be up over on the Eagles YouTube page and PhiladelphiaEagles.com. Uh, by the time you're listening to this podcast, you can go check out all of the film clips uh, that I posted and I, or I recapped. You can also go check out the pre or the post snap read where I did a little bit of a deep dive into the Eagles' usage of the tight end position in this past game. So make sure you go check both of those pieces out over on PhiladelphiaEagles.com. Make sure uh, always you're checking, you're subscribed to the Journey to the Draft podcast. As of right now, again, we're only a few weeks into the season, four games in. Eagles have three projected to have three top ten picks uh, in this draft. So. If you want to know who the top prospects are, we are talking about them every single week, twice a week, over on the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by LifeBrand, wherever podcasts can be found. Now's the time. Make sure you go subscribe to the Journey to the Draft podcast wherever podcasts can be found. That said, let's get to our chat now with Greg Cosell. It's time for Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. All right, well, let's jump into the film now as I welcome in my friend Greg Cosell to talk about uh, the Eagles' loss to Kansas City. Greg, uh, thoughts here? Happy uh, happy Monday night. <laughs> Fan, same to you. <laughs> no, no, another Monday night. I guess we're uh, talking some football again. That's right. So, uh, I mean, look, Greg, this was, this was history on Sunday. Just the third time in the history of the NFL that no team recorded a punt. Uh, in the game. I don't know if you, if you were aware of that fact, but uh, an offensive day for certain at Lincoln Financial Field on Sunday, Eagles and Chiefs. Uh, I guess we'll start with the Eagles offense. A, a lot to discuss there from that standpoint. I, just starting with the quarterback. Thoughts overall on Jalen Hurts and his performance here against Kansas City? I guess I'd answer it this way. And I made this note when I was when I was finished watching. I said, Hurts continued to show flashes of quality quarterback play in his eighth NFL start. The question is whether he can develop the patience and pocket poise needed to make the throws that he leaves on the field when he breaks down prematurely and drops his eyes. That's basically where I stand with Hurts right now. He leaves a lot of throws on the field and then makes some really good ones. Yep. And, I, you know, the, the question that to me is the question. I think like especially when you look at uh... – High red zone. They had a couple of posts that were open. There was the one that I think every, obviously everyone saw the one to Ertz where he kind of airmailed it. But there were a few where he did not pull the trigger, where there were no. receivers running to the post. And uh, there were, the other big one was middle of the field, uh, I believe end of the second quarter. They ran that cross-country dagger concept. He had Quez Watkins flying down the seam, and then he had Zach Ertz ah. on the dig. Um, you know, And he checks it down to Kenny Gainwell. And it doesn't, I, you know, he did a nice job getting – one to two to three to four. He just got through that fast and, and kind of got to the check down a little too quickly. But to your point, uh, and that's something that Nick Sirianni referred to. He, he referenced that uh, in his press conference. He said, look, there, there are going to be plays where, yeah, I, I want you to stay in there, stay in the pocket and let it rip. Right. But, um, you know, the, he made plays as a scrambler. And he made some big time throws in this game as well, to your point. So, yeah, uh, I mean, continue to see him grow. Look, it was his eighth NFL start. There's positives. And there's some things that need to be cleaned up. The play you're referring to was actually Gainwell's third. He ended up throwing it to Gainwell. It was his yep. third reception in the first half. All three came out of empty sets. Um, but you're right. They ran dagger to the field. Watkins got on top of the Chiefs secondary on his inside go route. Hertz came off Smith. He never processed Watkins because what he, what he does, Fran, and, you know, again, 
to me, maybe I'm old school, but he drops his eyes. And that's something that needs to be worked on. Because as soon as you drop your eyes, you're done with your progressions. Mm. And there were a few times, too. It's like, uh, and you you taught me this. You, you pointed this out to me. It's like the, uh, and this was years ago, not only when he'll drop his eyes, but also he'll kind of square his body up to the rush because he's ready. Now he's in fight or flight mode. And you'll see there were a couple of opportunities there. Um, you know, there were some down in the red zone. I know the first uh, red zone third down of the game where uh, he kind of ran around in the, he ran around the circle that broke the pocket to his right, where he squares up to the rush. And now you're not, you're not prepared to throw this football, right? You're now you're, no. uh, you're trying to escape and make a play uh, with your legs, which he does really, really well, but it's a matter of try, just trying to uh, you know hone in on that. And I guess, there was an interesting line um, from the Sunday night football broadcast, Craig. I don't, I don't know how much you watched it on Sunday night. Uh, there was there was a game on uh, between the the Bucks and the the Patriots. I don't know if uh, you had heard. I was not those, aware of that. Those two teams were playing on Sunday. They, really, night. they hadn't really talked about it all week, so I wasn't really aware of that. <laughs> well, there was a there was a good comment from Chris Collinsworth, and he was talking about uh, the Patriots and uh, Mac Jones, and he said, "Look, the Patriots right now, obviously, they're trying to win games, and you're trying to develop a young quarterback." It's tough to do both at the same time, right? Because you're trying to train the young quarterback and get him to do things that may seem uncomfortable, but you also are trying to do things that make him comfortable so you can move the ball and win games, right? So it's a, uh, I guess it's that fine line that staffs when you're trying to groom that young quarterback that you have to kind of toe. And I think it's increasingly more difficult when you have a quarterback with movement ability, because what's the balance? What, and we've discussed this before, Fran, what's the balance between teaching a quarterback the subtleties, the nuances, the disciplines of playing the position from the pocket versus him getting out of the pocket and making plays with his legs or his arm outside of structure? There's a balance there. Where where the balance tips the wrong way is when there are clearly defined throws that the quarterback doesn't get to because he breaks down too early. Hertz is in a little bit of that mode now. Um, I'm not a coach, so I'm not going to sit here and say that's easily correctable or not easily correctable, but you, you leave throws on the field. You you mentioned he did leave a touchdown on the field. I think it was, was it on the first possession where it was third and eight and he had Smith on the, on the post. Devontae in the post. Yep. They were yeah. a double post concept. And, and that, that look, if he, if he pulls the trigger there, like, that's a you and I are sitting here tonight saying like that was a big time quarterback throw. Um, well, no, it's, uh, but that's it's, like that's the thing. Yeah. It's like that's that's what they're scripting. Well, yeah, it's it's a piece we'd break down in the matchup show. Yeah, because no question. It's a designed concept yep. against single high where the inside post takes care of the 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 post safety, and then you get your one on one working on the outside. We we I've, we've broken that play down with the Chiefs, by the way, over the years. Um, every team pretty much has it in the playbook. That's that's a throw you got to make. I mean, again, you can always sit and say inexperience, but there are certain th- throws you just have to make. Yep. And so right now he's sort of at that stage where you go on a couple of plays, you go, wow, that's really good. And on others, you go, wow, that's that's not so good. And then I don't know the answer as far as development, because I'm not a coach and I don't presume to be one. So um, we'll see. But it, but it's all there on tape. The good and the not so good. It's all right there. And believe me, the coaching staff knows this. Sirianni's talked about it publicly. Yep. No, no question. And I think it was interesting just kind of looking at this game from a philosophical standpoint, looking at the Eagles offense, Greg, uh, very similar to what we saw in Atlanta and different, I feel like, philosophically than uh, what we saw week two, week three. You saw them get in that rhythm. The ball came out fast, moving the pocket. You had the RPOs. You had yep. the screen game that was a huge part. I thought they did some really good things in the screen game, kind of creating some eye candy and uh, you know, getting generating flow one way to come back the other. I just thought we saw a lot of really good things schematically in this I, game from the Eagles offense. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I don't care what people say about Nick Sirianni. I don't know the man. And I certainly don't know how he approaches the game uh, game plan, but I thought this was a really well schemed, well designed game plan. I mean, I like what they did to get him started. Um, first through first two throws, one read off misdirection, Ertz in the flat for 13, tunnel screen to Smith for 22. Third drop back was power run action with the pop pass to Goddard, another basic one read concept. They got him comfortable early in the game. I thought they did some really good things schematically. You know, we can talk about Hertz not pulling the trigger on some, and and ideally he gets better at that. But those were still really well-schemed concepts. 
Mm. Yeah. And to me, like uh, we've talked about the screen game. We talked, we saw the, uh, the use of Kenny Gainwell. Uh, oh yeah. We talked about three, he had three catches all in empty in the first half, but he was their big motion man uh, in this game, yeah. whether it was in two back sets or uh, if he was on the field in 11 personnel, uh, they, they used him off in orbits and jets, you know, just kind of get, getting him on the move. And uh, that helped create some room and create some big plays. No, no question. I mean, Gainwell is obviously a meaningful part of this offense, which I knew he would be because I watched his 2019 tape in Memphis in detail, and he obviously opted out of 2020, but I thought he was a really, really good prospect. I thought he was a better runner than some have given him credit for, but he was the the best. Re- he was the best receiving prospect in that draft and in last year's draft in 2020, and mm-hmm. the Eagles know that. I mean, they, yeah. you saw it all through training camp. Yeah. And just kind of looking at uh, Jalen Hurts' numbers, getting the ball out fast. I mean, in the plays where he had to get the ball out in under two and a half seconds, 16 of 22, two touchdowns, 160 yards. Now, on those plays where the ball is coming out in under two and a half seconds, those are typically well-defined plays. But when you talk about over 22 attempts where the ball is coming out fast, I think that speaks to well, that, how highly schemed the offense was in this game. Without question, without yeah. question. And I think one area he must continue to improve as well is his sense of timing and anticipation versus zone. Mm. I think that he does not really – he left some throws on the field as well and open zone windows, not really pressing it, and then he'd break down again in the pocket. These are all these are all things you can learn. You and I can't sit here and say, hey, he's going to learn them. We hope he does. Um, and, you know, but he also has some really good moments. I mean, it's 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 – it's both exhilarating and frustrating at the same time. Uh, this week, targeting the tight ends, I, I felt like the tight ends were such a big part of the passing game. 13 of 15 targeting Dallas Goddard and Zach Kurtz, 125 yards, uh, a touchdown. You had a couple that came off the board due to penalties as well. Um, the tight ends, a big part, Greg. And I thought we saw really kind of the full gamut when it came to Dallas Goddard. I mean, we saw great hands. We saw the route running. We saw the toughness after the catch. They did some good things with Zach Ertz as well, getting him open on some of those slide play actions and, and moving Jalen Hurts out of the pocket. We saw the big hole shot on the corner the corner out uh, in the fourth quarter uh, from Jalen Hurts to Zach Ertz. You know, I mean, both those guys were really good player, players. It's in this funny game. you mentioned that one because I thought that was really good by Hurts because the Chiefs are one of the best in the NFL with disguise and late movement to get to cover two. They do that exceptionally well. Yeah. And that was a play where they did that, and Hertz read the coverage and executed the throw, uh, the high throw, and what was a high low concept to the boundary. But there was no hesitation in his read or his throw there. I thought actually that was one of his better plays in the game, just from playing the, just as far as playing the quarterback position. And honestly, one of the other throws to Zach Hertz, I thought was one of his better throws too, and that was a ball that ended up incomplete. He had it was a similar, it was a, a corner post route, high red zone. He it was the ball perfect. No, it wasn't perfect, but that, those are the kind of throws he he sailed the one to Ertz early. The same part of the field, like almost identical. You're talking about the one the that Hertz had a reach for, and then he just couldn't quite grab. Just couldn't quite pull it in. I mean, it was. Yeah. But I like that he put, stuck it over the underneath defender. Yeah. Right, like if just yeah. feeling the uh, him layering that throw uh, down in the red zone. Yeah. I thought was a good sign. No, I think we we, I think we both agree that there's there's flashes here that we really like, and then we just hope that the other stuff can get cleaned up because you know it's so easy to say and and I know a lot of people say this well he doesn't process that's easy to say but you know what does that mean and is that really true I, I can't answer that I mean all I can answer is what I see on the tape and I know that there are throws that need to be made where he breaks down now hopefully you get past that and I alluded to a couple of those touchdowns that came off the board. And that has been a, a kind of a critical theme for this Eagles, the Eagles team, not even the Eagles offense for this both for the both offense and the defense, just untimely penalties. And it's something that the team is trying to focus on. They're going to try and get these corrected. Obviously they're trying to put together that first complete game back since week one against the Atlanta Falcons, but one penalty, the, the illegal man downfield uh, on the, the touchdown to Goddard that comes off the board. Another one where Zach Ertz, you had the offensive pass interference call against JJ Ortega Whiteside. Looking at both plays on film, I don't really put a ton of blame on either guy, on Dillard or on Arthega Whiteside, on either of those two plays. That, that's right. just me. But that said, they, these are just penalties that have to get cleaned up. Uh, but look, the, the tight ends could have been – they were a big part of the game plan, could have been an even bigger part of the game plan when you took a look at the box score uh, and say, that oh, two more touchdowns that could have come off the board. And look, three touchdowns total come off the board. That's 21 points. You get three total – or six total points, rather, out of those three, out of those three drives. 
that's a huge difference uh, at the end of the game. And it's just mistakes that this team can't afford to have. Let's talk about a couple of other positives. I thought that Dillard had a second consecutive strong game in one-on-one pass protection. I agree. I thought he was really good. And again, you know, obviously we we can't speak to the run game because they don't do that. Um, but he was really good in pass pro. The other thing, I thought Devonta Smith was really good. I thought he showed excellent route quickness with the ability to separate at the top of his route stem. I think the best compliment you can give him is he looks like he did at Alabama with his ability yeah. to separate and win on multiple routes versus man coverage. Yeah. I mean, he did that. He, you know, he's got great quickness in, in kind of an interesting way at the top of his route stem. But I thought he looked really good. I mean, the the 38 yarder at the end of the first half, like that, that was big time. It was a great catch down the field, all that. The, the route he ran on the play after that, on what was it? It was like an 18 yarder or something like that on the, right. on the deep out route. I mean, he created like five yards of separation, did a great job of working inside, holding vertical, held strong on the vertical stand, then just put his foot to the ground and broke back to the, to the sideline. Uh, and you just see the corner just go flying by. It was an outstanding route. I thought he had another great route. I, it was definitely in the second half um, where, and I think he might have been working against Mike Hughes again as well where he basically ran what was, you want to call it a curl or a comeback, and he stopped on a dime and Hughes just kept running. It was actually a really good play, too, by Jalen Hurts because he had to kind of avoid a little pressure on his front side yep. and kind of climb and throw it. I don't know if you remember that play. I do, yeah. It was uh, it was early third quarter. Uh, yeah, there you he go. stepped up. It went for, uh, I want to say it was 22 yards. 21, felt I think like maybe 21 yards. Yeah, something along those lines. Another um, great route by Smith. Yeah, I mean, he goes, it almost looked like stutter, go, come back. Like, it was like, uh, right, right, right. And he has held vertical, uh, really sold that he was going for a deep route and then put the put the brakes on and came back on the on the comeback of the deep curl. It was a, it was a hell of a you route. You know, it's, well. it's funny, and, and, and then we can move on. It's funny you talk about motion so much because, you know, you know, you know what I do. So I see, you know, more of the NFL by the time we speak than you do, and maybe even throughout the week. And In some ways, I've gotten kind of immune to motion because so many teams do it. So I don't see it anymore in my brain. It doesn't always register as, wow, they're in motion. That that's really cool. Because every, you know, so there's it's the exception teams that don't do it now, as opposed to the ones that do do it. So it's not to me like, wow, there's motion. That that's a great thing because everybody does it. Yeah, I I bring it up because it was such a topic of conversation. Right, Uh, right. From week three to week four, the Eagles didn't run any motion against the Cowboys. And they, they came out and they ran. And look, at the end of the day, they're still 32nd in the league in motion. But I think what we saw uh, in this game was they used it well uh, for a, yeah. a handful of big plays. And I, I yeah, think that's important. Absolutely. Um, I guess just on anything else uh, offensively, nothing else that stands out, out except this. You talk about Andre Dillard. The fact that last second, uh, the Eagles had to kind of reshuffle the right side of that offensive line. Uh, it was planned that Jack Driscoll was going to be the right guard. He steps in at right tackle, uh, uh, and they make, they make uh, Nate Herbig that right guard. But the fact that they came in and, and played as well as they did, I think that that's a testament, obviously, to both of those guys as well, but uh, the coaching staff, Jeff Stoutland, uh, making sure those guys are ready to roll. I couldn't agree more. There was no issues with the O-line and pass protection in this game. Um so I thought it was a really, really good job. One other point I'd make is Hertz has been blitzed on 45% of his third down drops. Teams are coming after the Eagles, and maybe it's Hertz, maybe it's something else. We can't possibly know the answer to that question, um, but that's a high percentage of blitz on third down. So that's something the Eagles, I'm sure they're aware of, and I'm sure it has to be addressed because – It'll be interesting to see if if defenses continue to blitz Hurts and the Eagles offense on third down because they clearly believe they can be successful or they wouldn't be doing it at that high a percentage. I don't have his third down blitz numbers. I have his blitz numbers overall from this game. He's six uh, for 12 for 86 yards and a touchdown with one sack and three scrambles versus on third, blitz. On, th- on third down? On third down. Got it. Yeah, I've got it for just overall 10 of 18, 85 yards, two touchdowns. That's all blitzes, not just third down blitzes yeah. uh, against the Chiefs. So. We'll see uh, if that's a, a theme that continues. That's a, a good point on your part. Let's uh, let's move over to the defensive side. And we've mentioned at the top, no punts in this game. So it was an offensive game, which meant that it was not kind to the Eagles defense. We talked about this last week going up against Kansas City. That's a tight. You're not going to you're not going to hold them to 17. Very unlikely you're holding them to, to under 20. Right. And it kind of I think thematically what we're saying today is similar to what we said six days ago after the Cowboys game where 
you prevent you prevent some of those deep shots. I don't know that I've seen a game, Greg, where Pat, Patrick Mahomes is back there, patting the ball, patting the ball, patting the ball, settling for a check down or scrambling for two yards as often as I did in this one. I feel like they did a nice job for the most part of limiting those shot attempts down the field because they wanted to be aggressive. But the the big thing is that, and this is something they just have to fix: those runs that go for six, seven, eight, nine. They have to go for three, four, five. That, that's well, that's that's the big difference right now that, that needs to happen on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, well, we know the last two weeks they struggled with the run game against the Cowboys. The Cowboys are a totally different offense. They're foundational run offense, and they they struggled with certain kinds of runs. This game they struggled with other kinds of runs, and um, it was it was problematic. I thought I thought they once they saw how the Eagles were going to play two by two sets. OK, and they were going to use the slot corner Maddox to run with number two, even in their zone concepts, you know, split safety concepts, uh, even even uh, single high cover three. When they played some of that, they saw what the Eagles were doing with Maddox carrying number two to his side. They started to run right at the slot. Hmm. They had four or five runs to the slot because Maddox was gone. He was carrying number two. And Edwards Hilaire had a 15-yarder, a 17-yarder late in the second quarter. He had a 10-yarder um, uh, at, at, late in the third quarter. was the same run. And Wilson tried to compensate for the fact that uh, Maddox was going to carry. And then Edwards Hilaire cut it right back inside. Yeah. And the same concept, he had a 16-yard run in the fourth quarter. So they found something there that they knew they could get because Maddox was carrying number two in, in, in 11 personnel two-by-two two sets. Yeah, and so often we talk about pre-snap motion as well uh, in regards to the pass game. And I thought that the Chiefs did some good things from a pre-snap motion standpoint with the run game as well. Where you were they always do. Uh, move from one side to the other and the linebackers kind of bump. And look, at the end of the day, uh, when you play with that, with a split safety look pre-snap, you're going to have, obviously you're going to have a lighter box. And which means that you're going to have what's called a bubble in the defense. There's going to be a gap that's maybe unaccounted for pre-snap. It's accounted for in the run fit, but pre-snap, there's some softness there where the offense say, okay, this is our target. This is where we want to run the football. And the chiefs were just finding ways to be able to attack that bubble. The Eagles, they're just not winning enough of those one-on-ones. And again, that goes back to the, when you, people ask, What's going on? What, what's happening? Is it one player? Is it this guy? Is it this position? Is that no? It, it's a collective. It's a, it's something different each time. They just got collectively have to get better at winning some of these one on ones because when teams well, have even numbers in the run game, they're winning too many of those battles. And and they made a conscious decision that the way to to best contain this offense, not stop it, contain it, yep. was to stop the pass game. Okay, because they played almost 90% of their defensive snaps in this game in nickel. They played only eight snaps in their base defense, Fran. And clearly that was a function of the opponent because the Chiefs ran 29 plays in their base offense. And the Eagles decided, you know what? In some ways they said, if you want to hand it off, we're okay with that. But your point is exactly right. If, if you're going to make them hand it off, they can't get eight, nine, 10, 15, 17 yards. Yeah, all right, that's that. That's what you're trying to you're trying to prevent those big plays in the pass game. 17 yards is a big play, not just in the run game. That's a big play in the pass game. Like you were trying the whole right. idea of this right. is a limit that you're making the the offense work. The offense is over, over, the, over the last three weeks, San Francisco, Dallas, and this week Kansas City. They have shown that patience to be able to move the ball uh, and matriculate downfield. And so uh, when you look at it from that standpoint, the other and the other aspect is this: this is a defense that when you play this way. You, you have to take advantage when you get them to a third and long. Hey, they, they have an incompletion on first down, and then they run, and you get a right. stop, and it's now it's third and six, third and seven. You have to capitalize on that situation. That means a big play sack. That means a turnover. Just get find a way to well, get, off get, the them off the get the field. you got to get them off the field. For, the Chiefs yeah. were nine for ten on third down in this game. Yeah. you got to get them off the field. It doesn't matter how you do. Look, we would all love a turnover or a sack, but you just got to get them off the field. But you can't have what we saw a couple of them in this game once again is those, those third down. <laughs> Uh, offside penalties. You know, we're now the you know Josh Sweat had one where it was third and six. He jumps off sides. Now it's third and one, and now you've got Tyree Kill in the flat for a two yard pickup, three yard pickup, and it's a first down, and the drive stays alive. We saw the same thing last week. Barnett had one the week before. Yeah. Uh, I think when you look at the those, those are drive killers. It keeps the uh, offense on the field, and it's just tough to be able to go. So I, I think that's a, a big thing. I, I don't know that there's 
much else to talk about from a defensive standpoint. Obviously, no. it, was a, it was a tough performance. And then, you know, obviously, you know, when you get to the late in the game with the, the uh, 40, 40 yard touchdown yeah. to uh, Hill, I mean, that that's when you're just trying to, you know, you're, you're trying to make a play. Yep. And, no, and you know, at that, at that point, what are you going to do? No question. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about this week and spin this forward now to the matchup against the Carolina Panthers. We'll be down there in Charlotte, Greg, and we'll start on the offensive side of the football here for Carolina and what they will face here um, from a Philadelphia Eagles standpoint. So Joe Brady, Offensive coordinator, uh, previously at LSU. He was the pass game coordinator down there when they went undefeated with Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, uh, and huge, a huge offensive output. Turns that into the offensive coordinator job uh, under Matt Rule in Carolina. Overall identity of the Joe Brady offense, uh, if you could give us the elevator speech. Well, first of all, they want to run the ball. The run game is a meaningful part of what they want to do. Now they do not have McCaffrey and he won't play this Sunday either, but they want to run the football. And I think they want to run it with some volume. This is not just a team, a throw ball team. They do want to run the football. Um, But when it comes to the passing game, I think he's adjusted a few things because of Darnold, but in an ideal world, you want to get the ball out and you want to get all five receivers out. That That's a really kind of a foundation a yep. of what they want to do is they want to get all five receivers out. Um, McCaffrey, like I said, he won't play, but he's the best back in the league running angle routes out of the backfield. He just kills linebackers, kills them even when they're in zone because they do have to match up to him. But obviously Hubbard, the rookie from Oklahoma State, is not that guy. So they don't have that guy right now. It'd be a really difficult matchup for the Eagles if McCaffrey was doing that. Um, But, you know, one thing that really stands out on film, and obviously the game changed a bit this week when you got deeper into the third quarter and they were behind. But one thing that's really stood out on film is all the timing throws for uh, Darnold through the first, you know, three, three and a half games of this season, because Darnold is not at his best the longer he has to stay in the pocket. Right. Darnold is much better with timing throws, rhythm throws, get the ball out, define the reads for him. We just spoke about the Eagles offense being well-schemed against the Chiefs. One thing Brady has really brought to Darnold and this offense is defining reads and throws, and the ball has been coming out very comfortably. They attack specific coverages very well. They've got really good receivers. They have a great feel for attacking zone with multiple concepts. So Darnold has been able to be extremely efficient, which is not something I think we would have said about him in his three years with the Jets. Yeah, and I think there, to your point, when you talk about how they're able to create some of those well-defined throws for Sam Darnold, it goes back to some of those staples. You mentioned at the beginning of that, when you talk about Joe Brady, uh, the five out in the route, Obviously, you're not writing running. Typically, you're not running five isolation routes. Those guys, those routes are working in concert. One route Correct. setting up another to create that definition. And the other thing too, and I personally, I, I love this approach with what they do offensively. A lot of condensed formations where, uh, again, you're still getting five out in the route, but everybody pre-snap is lined up close to the hash marks inside the numbers where now you're, everything's expanding out. There's a lot of space to work with uh, outside the hashes. And I think that that's one of the other ways that they're able to kind of create some of those easy throws within three and five yards of the line of scrimmage. I remember watching uh, Robbie Anderson, a lot of his c- catches a year ago, DJ Moore, certainly this year with what they're doing with him. They do a lot to get those guys, the ball on the move. And it comes from looks like that, where you're going to start condensed and then kind of burst everybody out of the formation. Well, and I think uh... Um, another point with their pass game is they're not stuck with players playing speci- being in specific locations. Very fluid. DJ yep. Moore is is clearly their boundary X when they do that, but they move people around. It, it's not just a static offense where hey, he's the X, he's he's the Z, he's the slot. You know, we've seen we've seen them with receiver distribution and location move people all around. So it's, it's, it's an offense where you have to be aware of the different concepts that can be run from different receiver distributions and locations. Uh, you talked about McCaffrey running those angle routes. Uh, DJ Moore caught a touchdown on an angle route, lining up in the backfield against the Dallas Cowboys. I believe it was pretty sure it was a touchdown uh, down in the red zone. Uh, just kind of speaking to them moving these pieces around yeah. around the formation. Um, so you got these guys at wide receiver and, and DJ Moore, former first round pick. He was picked uh, 24th overall by the Panthers back in 2018. Philly kid from Maryland. 
yards after catch, a, a big part of his game. Big I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts. Obviously, I don't watch them every week, so I'm interested to get your thoughts on DJ Moore and just what he is right now. Where does he kind of stack up among some of the other top receivers in the league? He's got deceptive speed. I remember one of the reasons, as I recall, he ended up moving into the first round is because he ran a 4 4 And he doesn't look like that kind of speed guy, but even he, he had the 39-yard catch this week on the crosser, the shallow crosser that he turned up. You probably remember the play. And, and you could see the speed. You know, he doesn't have that look of a sprinter, but he he separates. And um, he can make contested catches. He's got good hands. I just think he's a really solid receiver. And I think we've seen that. Is this his third year or his fourth year? This friend? is his third season. This is his fourth season, 18, 19, 20, 21. Yeah, this is his fourth season already. He's been a really quality receiver. Just the Panthers haven't been very good. Right. And now they've obviously they're three and one and they, they, you know, they're playing well, but he's basically been a good player since he's been a rookie. You mentioned the other thing too, as well. Uh, no Christian McCaffrey these last couple of games. They've had to rely on Chuba Hubbard, the rookie out of, uh, out of Oklahoma state fourth round pick. He was a world-class sprinter uh, back in high school, Greg. And it was a big play back for the Cowboys uh, out in the big 12 Back in 2019, it was a little banged up last year. Interested to get your thoughts on what you saw from yeah. him on film this week, and uh, your thoughts coming into into the draft uh, well, on on Chuba Hubbard. It's funny you mentioned him as a sprinter because I watched his 2019 tape, and I thought he was a fascinating guy. Yeah. He's a little upright, you know, and, and that may be from being a sprinter, and he's also tall, so he's a little upright. But I, I thought he was a really intriguing prospect. You know, I watched his tape in 2020, and Again, I can't speak to what it, what's in his head, but he just didn't run to me as competitively as he did in 2019. Maybe, you know, short in season, didn't want to get hurt. Who knows? I, I don't want to put anything, you know, out there because I don't know. I just didn't feel overall the tape didn't show a, a, a runner who was quite as competitive as he was in 2019 because I thought he was a really good prospect based on that because he could take it to the house. Yeah, I, I thought he had some shades of Dalvin Cook, to be honest, based off that yeah. season. Uh, he had that kind of big playability. Uh, real quick, before we get to the offensive line, uh, one guy I think is interesting. Tommy Tremble, who was the third round ah. pick for them uh, out of Notre Dame this past year. Uh, this guy is a trained killer as a blocker, absolute assassin in the run game, lead blocking fullback, backside of plays. Uh, that was kind of his profile coming from Notre Dame. Uh, upside as a pass catcher, though, and we're see, we're starting to see the versatility with how they're using him, and they use him in a lot of different ways. They traded Dan Arnold last week for C.J. Henderson, the former top 10 pick at corner for the Jacksonville Jaguars. That kind of opens up a path for some more reps here for Tommy Tremble, the rookie third round pick. Yeah, um, I watched his tape in college just like you did. He's one of those guys as a as a run blocker. He'll melt your face mask. Now he's got some vertical ability in the in the past game, um, and we saw that two weeks ago when he caught a vertical route for thirty yards. Um, I think that's developing. I don't think he's yet there yet, and you can tell by this number of snaps he gets. They don't feel like he's there yet either. But I think down the road he can be that guy and develop into a a two-pronged tight end who can be a really effective blocker in the run game. Because, you know, you have to remember one thing. We know Joe Brady's there, but you and I know Matt Rule, and Matt Rule wants to run the football. I mean, Matt Rule does not want this offense just to be let's spread it out and toss it all around. Matt Rule wants to be a physical football team no question. on both sides of the ball. They're, they're, and we'll get to the defense in a moment, but they're really building that way. The weakness they have in their offense right now and theoretically, it's an advantage for the Eagles if their D line plays better. Is I think the O line for the Panthers is a pretty significant work in progress. I mean, I was I was going to bring them up next. That that was the issue for them against the Dallas Cowboys. And we Without talked about Cowboys defense a couple weeks ago. I mean, they just wrecked the game up front, uh, Dallas, and, uh, and Carolina had no answers. And the issue, too, is in the pass game, when they did have to have deeper drops, when down and distance required, not a quick game throw, yep. is they were chipping both pass rushers on the edge. And that tells you what they think of their mm-hmm. offensive tackles. We don't have to interpret that, Fran. Right. That, they're telling you what they think of Moten and Irving. Mm-hmm. And Moten, I know, is a big money guy. But I've never thought watching tape, and I'm not an offensive line guru, but I don't think Moten is a great pass protector. Uh, I just thought, I mean, he might be the best on that team, though, when you look at what well, he is the best on that team. right now. Yeah. But he's, in their mind, he's not good enough to, to go one on one against who the Cowboys were putting out there. Right. Uh, Cam Irving had all kinds of issues like this past All week. kinds of issues. Uh, it was it was a rough go. Uh, and so when you talk yeah. about the matchup here this week, that that's one that's imperative here for this Eagles team is uh, trying to find a way to be able to do what Dallas did. It's going to look different, 
but do what Dallas did in terms of being able to dominate this game in the trenches. Uh, that was certainly something that impacted the Panthers in this game from an offensive standpoint. Let's now flip the script. Let's go to the defensive side where uh, Phil Snow is the defensive coordinator. He followed uh, Matt Rule from Baylor previously at Temple. He was the defensive coordinator at both of those spots, working yeah. with Coach Rule. So uh, let's now take a look at what the identity is of this Panthers defense. A little bit different from last year to this year. I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on how you've seen it evolve over the course of the last two seasons. Yeah, no, to me this year, there's a lot more uh, multiplicity in what they yeah. do. Yep. A, a lot more multiplicity in terms of their fronts and a lot more multiplicity in terms of their coverages. I think last year they played a ridiculously, relative to the league, that is, a ridiculously high percentage of cover three. Yeah. And now they're doing an awful lot more. They they're very multiple both up front. They're very multiple in the secondary. They're a pressure team. They're, they blitz a good amount. Um, and the one thing they've been able to count on for the most part through four games is that they can rush the quarterback off the edge with two guys in, in Reddick on one side and Brian Burns on the other side. Now, that didn't quite show up this week against the Cowboys. First of all, uh, Prescott didn't even throw the ball that many times. No, so but when was, he did, when he did, the ball got out so fast. I mean, yeah. he's, he knows where all his answers. Right, right. So I mean, it's a different kind of game. Yeah. But they can rush the quarterback. They're very good at moving people around pre-snap. They're very good at showing overloads. They're very good at dictating protections and then breaking down those protections. So they do bring a challenge to you. Yeah. Uh, that's why I'm glad to, to me that that last point is what stands out most to me about watching them on film. Is uh, you know, last year, and it's funny. Last year, I'm pretty sure they led the league in three-man rushes, eight-man drops, where they were just like, hey, we're going to drop back. We're going to play zone. Right. We're going to rally the football. We've got a fast group, young group. Let's just run to the football. This year, they are, they are so much more aggressive. Uh, yep. You're seeing them break down protections and, and attack them in a way that we did not see a week ago or a year ago, rather. So you know, you'll see them line up overload on left side. We're going to make you slide this way. Know that that's going to be your call. You're going to go four man slide to the left. And now we're going to create a two on one on the right. Brian Burns, who I love, I think Brian Burns is a great player. He's had so like four I. sacks where he was completely untouched. And he could just that speed blows. Like uh, he's some of the easiest sacks he's ever had in his life have come here this season. Well, you know, it's funny. I think that's why they made the trade for CJ Henderson because, right. and again, you know, he was a top 10 pick. I think you and I would both say that he has traits for the position. Okay, who knows what happened in Jacksonville? I don't know the guy personally, but I think they made the trade because they don't want to change what they do defensively because they lost lost J.C. Horn. Yep. And, and theoretically, Henderson at his best, if he can become at his best, and that remains to be seen, would allow them to continue to play the way I think that Phil Snow wants to be able to play, which is aggressive. Mm. Yeah, and even when you look at some of the guys they brought in, I mean, Rashawn Melvin, who's been around this league for a long time at corner, right? I mean, AJ Boye is, was their slot this week, and he almost played some snaps almost like a hybrid corner safety because they played nickel versus 12 numerous times, and Boye was kind of the, the overhang kind of box player. Yeah, and that's, that's what I mean. It's like when you have like th those kind of guys, and, and Melvin – Look, he's got some athletic deficiencies. They'll play a little bit more too high when he's on the field on the outside just to kind of give him some help. But he is a competitive guy. He's got ball skills. I mean, he's a fit for what they do defensively. And I think when you've got uh, Dante Jackson, previously J.C. Horn, you had that level of – you had that edge uh, you know, out there, especially with Horn. And you're hoping that Henderson can bring that. He, he ends up getting, he gave up the, the big play touchdown to Omar Cooper uh, in this game. Uh, but we yeah. talk about the, the, the traits that he's got. Once he kind of gets a little bit more comfortable, they're hoping that he can become he can be what J.C. Horn was for them. And now next year, uh, maybe you're cooking with gas. If you've got Henderson and Horn, or you've got Jackson. Uh, it's an interesting group. Yeah, you're exactly right. Try to get Henderson to play to his traits, and because uh, his traits were pretty good. The other loss they had in the secondary was Justin Burris, who was starting uh, at free safety for them. Jeremy Chin uh, is the other safety there, playing as kind of the strong safety. Sean Chandler steps in uh, to replace Justin Burris. Interesting to kind of get your thoughts on that, just that safety tandem. We, we've seen a decent amount of big nickel from them. Uh, we would see Justin Hurst yes. come down and play the nickel pre-injury. You mentioned how that was more Boye uh, this week, but thoughts on those that, those two safeties, and, and namely Jeremy Chin, you know, obviously in his second year coming from Southern Illinois. Well, Chin's a really good player. I, I think talk more about the other two safeties because they play Chandler, who's also Temple. Yeah. And uh, from what I understand from people who coach there, he's a great, great kid. And then they got Franklin. Who's so also a Temple kid, by the way. What's that? Sam Franklin is also a Temple kid. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. A lot so of Temple kids two, on this roster. 
two Temple kids there, and, and neither one is truly a post safety. So, you know, I think that that is potentially a concern um, because, you know, Burris was a fascinating guy because Burris was a corner coming out, I believe, of, was it NC State, Fran? He was. He was a, a really aggressive, long press corner at NC State. Yeah, he was a corner, and I kind of liked his college tape, but he's become a safety, and he's, he's got movement ability. You can – he – he's shown the ability to be a good blitzer. He's shown the ability to play in the box. He's shown the ability to play in the back end. They don't really have a true post safety right now. And so they have to, it'll be interesting to see what the workarounds are depending on who the opponent is because neither Franklin nor Chandler is really a true post safety. We're working a little bit back to front here. Uh, we started at the front with the pressure scheme, but I, I want to ask you about these linebackers. Uh, Shaq Thompson has been there for a long time. He was the team's first round pick back in 2015. Uh, now, you know, now with Luke Keekley gone for the last couple of years, he's kind of been that guy uh, in that room. Interesting to get your thoughts on his development. Um, and then Jermaine Carter, another starter for them, uh, is kind of working in the middle of the field. He comes off the field usually in sub, but uh, thoughts on both Shaq Thompson and Jermaine Carter. Well, Thompson, I think you see the the ability that he has because yeah. he was he was a safety and a running back coming out of Washington yep. and he's very very athletic and you know I used to do radio in Charlotte and so I'd watch Charlotte uh Carolina every week for years and I always thought that he was just always on the verge of being you know a really good player but wasn't quite there you know yep. despite the athletic ability I think he's better in this defense mm. than he was and it just might fit him better. It's no knock on the previous coaching staff, but I think there's more impactful plays that, that he makes in this defense where I, I feel that way anyway. And yeah, Carter, uh, I mean, you, you, you see him kind of cut loose as a blitzer more often. Yes. yes uh, you know, he can yeah. kind of use his athletic traits a little bit more. Would you? Yeah. So I think you would agree with that. Um, yeah. Carter was a fascinating guy. He's the Maryland kid. Maryland kid. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I kind of liked him coming out of college too. Um, he he doesn't play in their dime, but he does play in their nickel at times. And I wouldn't say he's a high level athlete, but he's not slow and sluggish. Um, yeah. I think he's a pretty good player. You know, I think he's one of those guys that every team would like to have. Not a special athlete, maybe not a special player, but a really solid assignment sound player. Yeah, he's a guy that that has flashed uh, numerous times yep. you know, watching him on film and just especially him playing downhill. Uh, Shaq Thompson as well. Uh, he had a great interception a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Shaq, you mean? Cover. Yeah, Shaq Thompson. Oh, Shaq against Kyle Wilson. Uh, it was Shaq Wilson, excuse yeah, me. Unbelievable the, yeah, unbelievable interception yeah, yeah. in the middle of the field. Yeah. Um, Going back to this defensive front, uh, Hassan Reddick listed at, at strong side linebacker. He and Frankie LeVu, both guys uh, really play, but essentially both guys playing down uh, on the edge. You've got Brian Burns. You've got Marquise Haynes coming off the bench. A lot of speed off the edge here for this group. But then I, I want to ask you, too, about the interior. you got Derek Brown, who was last year's first-round pick. Uh, they brought in Daquan Jones as a free agent signing from the Tennessee Titans. Uh, he's a former second-round pick, uh, or uh, day three pick, rather, from uh, Penn State. Then they go out and sign Morgan Fox from the LA Rams this past year. And he's a, he's a really solid player as well. Yep. Uh, so I, to, to me, that's a, it's an interesting front. And uh, I think we talked, you, you mentioned this at the top. They do a, a lot of multiple multiplicity here with this group because guys can line up and do lots of different things. Fox can play inside and outside. Reddick plays hand in the dirt or dropping back. Same thing with Burns. Uh, you know, just guys that have the ability to line up at a number of different techniques and win, but they do that. I mean, they, they line up with all these different fronts and all these different looks. No, I agree. They, you know, it's funny. They did get kind of handled a bit this week in the run game, but based on the first four weeks of the season, uh, I, I don't know if that's a big factor this week, yeah. you know, and unless the Eagles change up their approach based on film study and think, Hey, we can move these guys and we're going to run the ball. But, you know, so the, the, the run game element may not be a factor, but Derek Brown is one of those guys that he's just country strong. You know, he's a good football player, but you're right about Morgan Fox. Morgan Fox is an, you know, in some ways he's like Carter. He's another one of those guys that you love having on your team. Maybe he's not an all pro, but he's a really solid player who gives you really dependable snaps. I just remember, and I, I always bust Ben's chops about this. I remember last year preparing for the Rams when the Eagles played the Rams in week two and watching Morgan Fox and how they were using him in that game against the Cowboys in week one of 2020. I was like, man, right. like, should we do a segment on Morgan Fox and gameplay? He's like, Fran, we're not doing a seg a whole segment on Morgan Fox. I'm like, no, like they do some really good things. Look what he's doing here. Look what he's doing there. Uh, and then obviously look, he's, he turned it, he's turned a solid season last year for the Rams signed a nice deal here uh, with the Panthers and he's playing a role. He's a really, really versatile player. Uh, he can play both inside and outside. So quick, quick follow up here on Derek Brown. 
thoughts on him just in terms of, and this is kind of like big picture defensive right. tackle value, that kind of thing. Do you, how do you feel he has come along as a pass rusher uh, in terms of what you've seen now through a year and four games? I guess my feeling would be that I think there's still more to cultivate. Uh, you know, I, I thought coming out, we knew about how strong he was country strong. He could push people back at times. Uh, I, I think he's got reasonably light feet, Fran, for a man that size. He's not a plotter, but I think there's more work to be done for him to develop into a really significant inside pass rusher. Got it. He's a guy. I'll be, I'll be interested to watch him continue to develop. Uh, Do you agree with that, that, by the way? Yeah. I mean, that was the guy that like, when you see, it's funny. I've kind of gone back and forth with this. We talked about this with Ben last week in the show. When you see the amount, especially looking at this Eagles defense and you talk about, uh, I think that's a, kind of a, a wave we're seeing around the NFL a little bit with the, with some of these Fangio defenses is that uh, teams are okay playing with a little bit of a lighter box from a number standpoint. Does that does that kind of up the value for some of these stronger nose tackle types right. that, you know, maybe we would have said three years ago say like, oh, if he, if he can't get off to the quarterback on every down, like he's not, he's not, uh, he's not valuable. Well, maybe maybe that starts to come back a little bit and say, all right, if we're going to play later boxes, you need some of those guys that can eat up a little bit more space. Just one final point unrelated to the matchup, because I know yeah. we're wrapping up. Cover four has been incrementally increasing in the league. It's split yep. safety coverage, you know, it's quarters. But more and more teams now, and this is what happens in the league, more and more teams are attacking it with schemed concepts and yep. breaking it down. And it's going to be very interesting to see going forward because that's the way the league works. You know, two years ago, you know, everybody is all cover four, man. That's the that's what you got to play. Well, meanwhile, Brandon Staley, who everybody talked about last year, playing so much cover four, being a thick Fangio disciple, and yep. now he's with the Chargers. He plays the Chiefs last week, and he plays almost 80% man coverage. Yeah. So here he goes against the Chiefs, where everybody says, don't play man because they'll kill you. He plays almost 80% man coverage. Right. So everything is cyclical in this league. There's a lot of smart coaches. They're going to attack and break down cover four. And then the defense is going to have to make some adjustments. That's the way it works. And I've, oh, you and I have talked about this when it comes to, to zone coverage in general, but especially with cover four, uh, I think especially because there are so many like really well-designed route concepts that can attack yeah. it and break it down because there are so many rules that are involved with the cornerbacks and the safeties uh, in cover four. Yep. That if you the rules can have some gray areas to them right. based on the routes. And, and if you, but if you don't marry quarters, like you can't just date quarters. You can't just say like, oh, right, yeah, we're right, gonna run right, every once in a while. Right. Like you got you got to run quarters, and that's like your staple. Otherwise, right. that's where I feel like you get into trouble. So the teams that are quarters teams, you can get. I feel like you all right. Like well, we at least that we we have those rules worked out. A lot of more communication. Maybe that the execution can be a little bit better. I always worry about the teams where it's like, oh yeah, like quarters is like our third most used coverage or fourth most used coverage. It's like oh, like that's where you're gonna get burned to see a lot of those big plays. There, there are some routes, as you well know, that can beat quarters, and it's yep. it's a tough deal. It's a really tough deal. No doubt. Well, uh, Greg, this will be a fun matchup. I'm excited here to talk through uh, yeah, Eagles-Panthers. I, 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 we'll I, you know, I was saying to someone in, in our matchup crew today that I, I think that the Eagles have a really good shot to win this game. I mean, yeah. I think Carolina is clearly a solid football team, but I think the Eagles have a really good shot to win this game. Uh, it's going to be a fun one to break down. Well, Greg, we'll do it right here uh, on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade next week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. We'll talk a little uh, Eagles Panthers. Thanks, Fran. The Philadelphia Eagles and New Era introduced the Fly Collection, an elevated, boldly branded apparel capsule with streetwear appeal that's different from your standard Eagles fan gear. The collection sees bold new graphic expressions of the Eagles brand on apparel essentials like hoodies, t-shirts, jackets, and headwear. The designs are kept simple, mixing fresh modern branding alongside bold punches of color available exclusively at all Philadelphia Eagles Pro Shop locations and the team's official online store. Learn more and view the entire capsule at philadelphiaeagles.com slash fly. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the Draft Mailbag. Great stuff once again from Greg, who you can follow on Twitter just like I do, at Greg Cosell. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's Nose content that we produce here with Eagles Entertainment. You know how much I appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on social media. That is one way to support the show. But the best way is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating, or even leave us a comment. And I want to give a shout-out today to someone who did exactly that. Weissa Later left a five-star review saying, Jalen Hurts from under center. 
Hertz lined up in the shotgun over 95% of the time in the first three games, I believe. Performance has been up and down. I have heard Greg Cosell say in the past that he would be better served to take snaps from under center. This would help the running game and define the reads. Do you think that he has the footwork and comfort level to do this? Have you seen this from him last year or in college that he would thrive in a more conventional system? So, Weiss, I mean, that, that is something that some people will bring up when it comes to Jalen Hurts. They're really all young quarterbacks because when you put a running back under center, number one, you can diversify the run game a little bit better, right? You go, oh, your options out of the run game are a little bit more expansive when the quarterback is under center as opposed to the gun. There's pluses and minuses to everything, right? Now, the other thing is when you go play action, while that can define the reads for you, especially when you move the quarterback out of the pocket, if you run some of those boots and some of those nakeds, right, where the quarterback is out in the move, now it's just a half-field read. It's almost like, okay, here are two receivers on a high-low, and now you've got you know, your second option coming from the opposite side of the field. It's more defined, easier for the quarterback to kind of get through his progressions. That said, you're also kind of cutting off half the field. You're, you're Sometimes the, the defense is able to kind of key in on some of those QB movement plays. So there are pluses and minuses to everything. In the past, we have seen Jalen from under center, uh, not just here in Philadelphia, but you go back to his days at Alabama, obviously a little bit more pro style, a little bit more conventional, uh, especially early in his career. I know that they definitely had him under center a little bit more often down there with the tide. So Jalen can do it, but it's all, again, there's pluses and minuses to everything, and we'll see. Uh, Jalen obviously coming off a really impressive outing as we talked about earlier in the show uh, here against the Kansas City Chiefs. We'll see if he can continue to build on that. But uh, Weiss, it's a great question. Thanks so much for that. And thanks to everybody out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcasts here with Eagles Entertainment. That being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I'm Fran Duffy. We will talk to you later this week.